Rita, thank you so much for for jumping on and uh, on the show and having a, a bit of a chat to me over the next hour or so. Um, I think I'd, I'd really love to start with a little bit of a background about yourself and and sort of where you've been and and what you've what you've accomplished in the past and and what's led you to where you are today. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Um... I've had a um, a bit of a unusual career path for me. Um, I started in the field of psychology, so I'm a registered psychologist, and I grew up in psychometric assessments, um, starting in um, New Zealand, um, working for consultancies around and using assessment for selection and development and coaching, um, and then moved across to Brisbane, where I, um, I worked for a consultancy as well, and really kind of broadened the the offering around um, OD, L and OD, coaching, career transition, leadership, facilitation, things like that. Um, and I've spent most of my career there, which has given me some really good skills around stakeholdering and influencing and pitching yeah. and things like that. Um, about five years ago, I moved um, internal to Fletcher Building Australia um, as the learning and um, organizational development manager for Australia. So we have five divisions of Fletcher building four of them are in New Zealand with about 10,000 people and there's about almost 5,000 people in Fletcher building Australia and so I look after um, learning and org development for for that division so it's a slightly different lens now I'm I'm, I'm in the business now um, and which is good it's a slower process a longer process but it's a deeper process which I like um, and I look after um, we have a safety culture project with leadership and frontline programs that we're running. I look after inclusion, diversity, talent, so top talent in succession um, and accessible learning. So we have a whole strategy around accessible learning for everyone, um, which is important because Fletcher Building Australia is with manufacturing and building products and distribution. So while there are a number of people we call um, wired or online, like we are now, there is a significant number of people who are not. So they are driving trucks or making insulation or yeah. um, role forming and things like that. So we have a entire strategy around the concept that everyone should be allowed to learn or should have access to learning in some way, even if they don't have an email address. Yeah, I, lo I love that. I, I feel like mm. um, it's quite easy for frontline workers to kind of feel a little bit left out sometimes, right? Because mm -hmm. they're not mm -hmm. this and they don't get the... Uh, the same the same benefits as, as as some of us do in in, in our in our homes um, mm -hmm. or cubicles um that's really interesting so you you came from a psychology background that must mm. be a tremendous benefit working with people i would imagine it's hugely helpful i think um particularly um everything is around behavior right so people have skill sets and then they have how they behave in different environments and it's fascinating i do a lot of um senior coaching and we spend um, at the exec level and we spend most of our time talking about behavior we don't talk about capability we talk about insight raising feedback honesty transparency role modeling all that kind of stuff that's actually what's really important when it comes down to it because generally when you're in a leadership role you're probably pretty good at the skill set of the function that you're leading as the assumption it's actually that extra behavioral stuff that's really important um, and it also helps because we also look after the well-being and resilience strategy for the business too. And that's obviously been very critical in the last two to three years. And so that's been um, something that's gone from a nice piece that we offer to a major strategy item in yeah. order to assist our people with resilience, well-being, burnout, um, all of those things as they've gone through lockdown and out the other side. Yeah, that's 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 unreal and it sounds like you get quite a lot of access to the leadership within the business and mm. that they seem to be quite forward thinking by the sounds of it then on, on the l d front how, how do you sort of go about aligning your your day-to-day -day and your l d strategy with the business strategy because it sounds like they're quite open and receptive to to mm. talking about those things yeah i think that um i think if i didn't have our l d offerings aligned with strategy i just wouldn't get anything across the line so yeah. there's a few things that we do. Um, we have two reasons that we would be running with a strategy or linking to strategy. First is the business improvement. So what are we doing with the business? Are we focused on innovation, sustainability, efficiencies? And do we need to up the capability there in terms of being able to understand financial implications and things like that? In which case we need to align our L&D for that. 
and the other is around people uplift so how do we um, retain and develop our top talent and we call them top talent because we run talent forums in order to identify who they are how do we do that to a keep them here because it, they're thriving on it but b line them up to be successes for the business um, and then what we then do is think about, okay, what does the business need? What are they focused on? And what are the other deliverables that would help execute the strategy? So that's where mental health and well-being comes in. Um, and I would liaise with the leaders and create a business case around why we would need to do this as a strategy um, in order to get them across the line. The other piece that's really important for us, we're very fortunate at Fletcher Building is that we have a um, education trust where we're actually able to access funds um, in order to help the L&D and the capability uplift of our people. We're very fortunate. Amazing. But to get anything from there, you must have a very, very strong business case. You must know your cost, your return on investment, what you plan to do with it and how you plan to turn the dial, so to speak, on either the business or the people or both. So linking it to strategy is hugely important. And I think working in consulting has been really helpful for that. Yeah, I because agree. you know, I remember being taught years ago, write your business case down on a page, and if you can't finish the business case, it's not a good one, and they won't say yes. So if you can finish it, here's what I need, here's why, here's the catalyst for it, here's how it will be implemented, and here's the cost compared to the benefit. If you yeah. can complete it, you're probably going to get it across the line. Um, and if you can't, just start again. It's just not ready. Yeah, absolutely. That that's. That's amazing. So it's sort of like three core things there. In in terms of the the business case, um, have you have you had any any sort of things go really well or, or maybe really poorly where you've you've sort of realized, hey, I can I can maybe pivot or change or oh, this was really really receptive that um that that you've sort of learned from. Yeah, yeah. So we'll start with poorly because lots of those. <laughs> um, first of all, poorly I think comes down to two things. Yep. In my experience, the first is timing. Yeah. And the second is um, know who you're speaking to yeah. and whether they are the right people. So the, in an in internal business, so if you're working internally, timing is everything. There's no point talking about programs and capability uplift and what you're going to do in June because budgets are set. It's yeah. too late now. The strategy is written. We need to be warming up to these conversations well, in our business time-wise in January. December, January, start talking about where they fit and why. And look, to be honest, if it doesn't fit the strategy or support the people, we've got to ask ourselves why we're doing it. Yeah. Um, and so I've learned the hard way trying to get in there with something that I think is really amazing and it's too late. And they've said to me, cool, no, <laughs> yeah. we can't do it. And then the second thing, which I learned in my consulting days is just because someone's really enthusiastic about your idea. And someone thinks, oh, that's so great. I love it. I want to implement it. Doesn't mean they're the decision maker. Yeah. And doesn't mean that they're the people who could say yes. And so understanding who are your cheerleaders, so just really pumped, but have no influence. Who are your influencers? So you need to get them on side because they'll help you. Yeah. Or maybe they've got the air of the senior person that you need. And then who is the actual decision maker? Because when I worked in consulting, I'd get all the way through on this project and I'd say, thank you so much. I'm just going to take this to my manager to sign yeah. off and you're like oh oh I should have been talking to that person yeah yeah you're like oh no it's going to get lost in translation here yeah or... yeah now I'm back to 50 50 and I was 90 um so I think where I've not done very well is where I've misread who the decision maker is which is as easy as so do you make the decision yeah um and timing knowing when it's the same when I coach people around asking for a pay rise yeah don't do it in July done it's locked in they nothing they can do about budgets like warm them up to the idea so they can at least consider it and put money away for you otherwise they may completely agree with you but their hands are tied yeah so and also storytelling if you don't start tell a good story if you don't show them how it works if you haven't thought about their people so you know if i want to take them off site for three days I've got to be really careful. It's three days of lost productivity. This better be the greatest program of all time. <laughs> um, to do that, you know, how am I thinking about the people? Am I running it in short modules? Am I really working so that they can see the benefit? That's that's if I haven't done that well enough in my past, that's where I've gotten uh, no. 
you know, that's where kind of L&D falls into that's really nice. We'll do that if we have time. And that's the box you don't want to be in. Yeah. You want to be in that this is critical. Absolutely. And I, f- I feel like it's very easy for L&D to get put in that box, right? I, I, I feel like I see that quite often where it's like, oh, yeah, it's an L&D thing. And it's like, no, no, this can impact performance and metrics mm-hmm. and, and where we're going. Yeah. Um, that's that's awesome. I really like what you said about that storytelling storytelling there. And I feel like that's something that gets gets often a little bit lost. Um, mm. During that, I guess, that storytelling process or where you're framing, hey, this is why we want to do something. Is that when you start to look into the different learning activities that you might execute on or or, or those components and and sort of how how and what have you seen work in, in that space in, in the realm of like, okay, well, these are some things that actually, you know, we implemented and they work really well and it lets you sort of set that narrative. Yeah, I think um, knowing your stakeholders is really important. So I have um, really strong um, HR leaders. So we have the Australian division and we have six businesses that sit underneath, well, kind of five and a half yeah, that sit fun. underneath and each of them are, we have heads of HR, but we also have executive general managers. And so I've worked really hard on relationships with our senior leaders and so have they to the, to get to the point where we, you are going to recommend something, they say, okay, yeah. Um, and so it's around, first of all, doing your homework and getting to know the business and know what the business needs. So we have almost 400 sites um, all around Australia. That's very difficult. You know, if we ran a workshop in Brisbane face to face, people in Brisbane still have to travel and have accommodation and in Queensland because it's a big place. So it's around making it work. So, for example, in um, and getting them on side first, because if the leaders are on side, they will make the time to do so. So when we came five years ago, um, we wanted to really create a learning culture, a culture of learning where learning is pulled rather than pushed. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, So we made learning smaller and bite sized and relevant. So when we um, come 2020, we decided we needed to do so much more in mental health and wellness. Um, I got the senior leaders together and we told the story of mental health. And we also told the story actually of um, suicide rates and particularly in the regions because our demographic is, um, tw- is 26 to 48 males. And all of a sudden, we are the dominant demographic now in this mental health category Mm. and an at-risk category. And what we talked about that. And once we told that story and talked about it, the response I got from the leaders was, what do you need us to do? Mm. And so when you get them there, you think, A, I've made a good point. This is definitely important. And then what we offered was um, support that was tangible for the business. So it wasn't, we actually stare away at the moment and for the last couple of years from anything face-to-face, anything long. Um, If it is face-to-face, it's short and it's bite-sized because I went to a workshop with Dr. David Rock a number of years ago from the Neuro Leadership Institute and I changed everything I did about L&D. Like walked out of that workshop and went, we're doing it all wrong. You need three minutes to learn something. Yeah. So any program you've got, you know, every program I went, I reassessed all of it. I said, does it really need to be eight hours? Could it be six? Could it be five? Could it be two? How are we doing this differently? And so with this mental health strategy, we had options for using an app and options for 45 minute webinars, but we also turned things into toolbox talks on practicality. And so what we were able to do is give ownership to the businesses to decide what they wanted to use and when. So people don't like being told what to do. No. <laughs> um, they like to have a bit of control themselves and they should. It's yeah, five businesses. Right. So, you know, they're all a little bit different. So they like to be able to be given the framework and then support in order to deliver it. And then they like to be able to go, you know what, I'll choose the toolbox talks. I'll choose the webinars. That's what we'll do. And that's really when you're looking at shaping a solution, you know, it's best to get out in the business and hear, you know, hear what they're saying, hear what is going to work. And sometimes a poster and a cheat sheet and a toolkit is what we call them out on site or on those notice boards in the lunchroom is actually hugely beneficial um, as opposed to necessarily jumping on a webinar. So it just, we give those different options and we've definitely moved away from the longer programs unless we think it's valuable right into the bite-sized deliberate um development oriented and kind of just in time learning so that's kind of where we're moving to or have moved to 
yeah that that's 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 unreal the um the sentiment i think of of reducing that down is something that that often gets overlooked i was talking to uh the former head of lnd at spacex and i sort of had a million questions where i was like oh you guys send things to mars literally uh yeah what's your learning program like and yeah. their philosophies is literally they say uh do less learning and by that they don't mean reduce options what they mean is we have an outcome to achieve and how can we get there as quickly as possible uh because people really appreciate that um yeah. so I, I definitely yeah i definitely would echo that that sentiment you you mentioned a few of those things like a workplace toolbox and some things that you sort of might um might drop in uh and 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 out of someone's day in, in a few minutes how do you how do you sort of measure the the impact of those and and potential like I know something like a mental health program might be a bit different to something we're trying to uplift capability obviously but how have you gone about sort of assessing you know what what's been working for you? Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good question because we need data for momentum. Yeah. So we need to be if we're going to say this is going to work, we better show that it's going to work a work to work. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I've got a couple of great team members who are very good at this. And, and what we do, we have a few philosophies. The first is everything is a pilot until it's not. Yeah. So we're brave. I went to a conference a few years ago and heard from some real big powerhouses and was completely inspired because they decide to fail fast. Yeah. They try it, implement it, go, and everything's a pilot. And I thought, yes, that is exactly how we should do it. So we run everything as a pilot and we try it. And we try it because you can't get five businesses to align and go at the same time. It's madness. Grab the one who's ready to go now and run it like a pilot. And we measure everything. So we actually, we think about what it might impact. So when we're looking at um, our top talent, we have a top talent academy and a top female talent academy. Um, we look at what it, what it might turn the dial on. And we think retention, internal mobility and turnover um and engagement so we think okay how on earth are we going to measure that so we look at um outcomes of the programs they've been on feedback from them both qualitative and quantitative um, we look at um so for our um, safety culture program we look at safety data yeah. um, engagement data and we actually measure everything because at the end of the day if it has if you're thinking that's a real stretch, I don't think that's correlated. It's fine. We haven't lost anything, but we need to have all that data up front. So with our safety culture program, which has been a huge program, we measure TRIFA, so total reportable injury frequency rate. We measure um, our safety culture using a Bradley curve model. We measure engagement, which we don't, we can't attribute solely to that. But when we measure the qual when we look at the qualitative comments below, we can attribute it to that. We gain their feedback too, which you know it's arguably it's their opinions and it's very subjective, but we still collect it. Yeah. Um, we get quotes, we get interviews, we get reflections, and then we look at some of the harder data as well to see if there's been an impact. Um, we also measure um, across the business, we measure learning completion. So that's from our anytime content where people can pull the pull the content like micro learning. Yep. And we also, so we can see um, what people are learning and how much they're learning. And we um, also measure hits to our um, SharePoint sites and our learning hubs and things like that. To, to see what they're using, what they're looking at, and hopefully that it is increasing based on what we're doing with the content. So we measure, very long-winded way of me saying, we measure absolutely everything so that we can understand what's going on. And if we're having an upwards trajectory and it drops, let's go check it out. What has happened? What has changed? Is it a business impact? Maybe they've been doing stock take, so it's fine. Um, but what is it that we're doing? And because we have that pilot mentality, it doesn't matter. You know, we try something, it's not working, stop, pivot, move forward, keep going. And everyone loves being part of a pilot. It's actually yeah. really easy to get people on a program if it's a pilot and they're yeah. the first ones. You, it's a lot, there's a lot more momentum going on there. Yeah, absolutely. I think being part of something a bit new and exciting is mm. is, is great. And you can sort of use that momentum to propel you into, into getting some awesome results. Mm. It sounds like you've got a really mature uh data sort of analysis and collection um uh setup or uh whatever you might refer to it as um what 
what and sort of how do you decide in terms of technology to implement? Because it sounds like you've got some some really cool stuff that that you, you you're collect, collecting and capturing there. Uh, and I feel like L and D is is low in the totem pole sometimes of tech stacks, and and they sometimes might not get the same the same budget as and, and love as some other areas. Mm. Uh, how did you sort of decide what your tech stack looks like, and how have you gotten to to where you are? Well, actually, it's a really good question because we are, um, our head office is in New Zealand and actually to a certain extent, um, while I look after L and OD, I don't decide on a lot of those big things because it's a group-wide initiative. So in terms of our LMS or the way we run things, we, we run with whatever the business does. I think what we do that I'm pretty proud of my team for is that we look for all the little things that we can find in order to help us. And sometimes it doesn't need to be too complex at all. We have this philosophy that if you want to do something, it's probably been done in another area of the business some time ago, so go find it and utilize that. So when we're collecting data, we will collect, we have a platform to measure all our safety data. Mm -hmm. um, we actually just use things like Teams forms and things like that to map data. We have formulas. We have a lot of business analysts that can help us to create formulas and tables in order to, to measure what we're doing in terms of our outcomes. And we have a lot of, we have an HR system that we, we measure our people stats as well. So what yep. we do every month is we have reports that we're pulling and generating and then we're filtering them out. And then we're actually sitting back and looking at them. And in terms of getting L&D up there, I just started creating monthly reporting data and I slotted it into their monthly um, ops packs. Oh. And they were like, cool, thanks. Yeah. So I don't think they didn't want it in there. Uh, I think that they were always just looking at people's data and things like that. I was just like, hey, here we are. Um, and I think that you can look at that trend data too. And then we have a newsletter that goes out monthly. It's just funny how much traction a newsletter gets, but it, they really like yeah. it. Um, so we've given ourselves a page in there with, and we share the learning data and things like that. And we like to gamify things. So people love a bit of competition. So when we show how all the business units are going and this one's behind the other, they mm. want to get up there. Um, we ask them to send in photos and, and things like that. And we give out prizes and things like that. People like a little bit of reward and a little bit of incentive. And that really helps us to get our, our data up. But we use the data to then show success. And then we use the data to then help us secure budget for um, programs in order to move forward again. So it's kind of our reason why mm. um, in order to help us. So, yeah, it sounds like you've you've almost got like a self-fulfilling cycle there where you've, um, it sounds like you've made the most of what you had regardless, mm. Uh, mm. which is like fantastic. I love that you've just sort of gone, hey, we're a big business. Like, let's just look around. I think this stuff's probably yeah. done before. Um, yeah. And, and sort of made the most of what you've had, which has then led to people maybe being a little more open. And have you found that the leadership after they've seen that, did, did that feel like it unlocked some doors where they sort of saw you you making a bit of traction? Like, oh, maybe we should give a little bit of love here. Is that something that sort of organically? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And they start reaching out anecdotally and things like that. And I think for them, one of the biggest uh, struggles we have mm. and will be similar to other businesses is that we are pressed for time. Yeah. So resources are tight. There's a low unemployment rate. We've got a lot to do. Um, demand is here and supply is here. You know, we work really, really hard so people can think that I don't have time for learning. So we get a lot of traction where we've really heard the business and we have really great um, people and performance functions in each business and they actually roll out their own L&D as well so around the technical skills and things like that and they have their own little initiatives that they are very successful with so um, we get traction there we either support them or off they go but we talk really well together and I think um, for us it's just about hearing the business and the more you can hear the business and to be honest stop when, they, when you think it's best to stop, like pause yeah. and hold, which is something in consulting, I've never even heard those words, right? You just barrel ahead. <laughs> um, knowing when to stop and when to hold um, is almost as important as knowing when to launch. Yeah. You know, if the timing's not right, we wait. You know, sometimes like we are L&D, so we're not paramedics. It'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, what's worse, rolling it out and launching when they don't want it and they're busy and flat out or waiting saying, we heard you, we're going to do it here now. So that consultation with the business is really important. 
and just knowing them well enough that we can almost fend off. So if something's coming down and we think, hey, that's not, our business is not going to be ready for that, we can say, hey, can we move that by a month or so? Yeah. And knowing when the timing is, it gives you a better impact and better traction because you can't unlaunch something. Yes, that's so true. Yeah. And, and what kind of key or leading indicators do you have to sort of establish that timing? Is there anything that you sort of look for in particular to, to sort of work out, okay, maybe this area is ready, maybe this area is not, or has it been something that's worked really well for you? Um, yeah, we have, um, we have yearly calendars around when we want to drop things. And then we speak to the um, ops leads and the people in performance leads around their individual calendars too. And we kind of map them up together. But we have this concept, which I think is really successful for us. And it's called freedom within a framework. Yeah. And what that means is we provide the framework. We provide the context. So I'm running a, um, we're helping to roll out a um, frontline safety program, which is really cool. It's, it's not even technical safety, it's behavioral safety, hearts and minds stuff. Yeah. And we've got the framework. And if they want, I will support the rollout and drive it every month for them. And some businesses have said, yes, please. Yep, come on in. And other businesses have said, no, I think we're good. Thank you. And they've got it and they're rolling it out how they want. Yeah. And so long as you're giving them that flexibility, you're going to get a lot more traction. And all I need every month is the reporting. Who's attended? How many? Versus forecast. What did they think? How did they go? What's the feedback? What do the action plans look like at the other side? What's the shift we're seeing? Um, and so when we get that data every month, if I'm comfortable that businesses is off and flying and a few of them are, it's fine. Yeah. Um, and then checking in with the right people. So again, you know, sometimes you'll check in with someone about, yeah, that's fine. Come on in, launch this project. And we haven't asked the right person. Yeah. who's saying, please, no, wait, we are under the pump. This is not okay. We can't do this right now. So a lot of it is really good stakeholdering and just knowing when to do what. And so that's a big learning for me coming internally. And that, you know, it's against my nature to pause. That just seems counterproductive to me. But okay. now that I've seen it, it's better. It's okay. You know, months like May, hectic just before month it's just before year end it is a crazy crazy productivity month we need to rethink what we do in may december and january keep them clear yeah you know um knowing things like that about your business knowing november is pretty good at the beginning and then take the accelerator off yeah. um, it's hugely helpful because they're busy kind of ramp you know going into to christmas as well and mm. it does shorten what you can drop when but there is also nothing wrong with thinning back your offering and making it more impactful. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think having a thinner, but more impactful offering is, is always going to win. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess it's, it's, it's hard to stop momentum, right? Because like you feel ready, you're like, I'm on a roll, I'm going, but you're really, you're, you're sort of servicing somebody else. So if they're not ready, it doesn't really matter how you feel. Um, mm. but I think that's, that's fantastic. That, that sort of momentum break and, and really working in. And I feel like, that would make them feel heard, which then makes them feel appreciated. And like you actually, you know, you, you, you are listening and then they're probably more liable to do the training because they, they're they like, oh, they're listening to us. So, you know, let's jump in and let's do this. It's probably going to be good. Yeah. Um, and some of, the, some, of it, some of it has to be done, right? And they're like, I don't well, really want compliant. to do it. And it's compliance or whatever, right? Yeah. But other stuff, you're probably doing it because there's a need. Mm. But they understand the need, you know, generally when we've done a good job at conveying that it's not a no it's a not now and yep. no they can't put it off forever you yeah. know <laughs> yeah. but you know sometimes we do also reevaluate is this still a need mm. you know if it's not a compliance so you know compliance is a lot of our um privacy and anti-bribery and corruption things like that but also things like inclusive leadership you're just you're doing it it's not what it's when yeah. Uh, so whether you're doing it, sorry, it's when you're doing it and that's your freedom within a framework. But for other things, oh, it's just still a need. Let's check. Yeah, absolutely. And, and with the freedom within a framework uh, component, it sort of sounds like you've, you've done sort of the hard yards of, of compiling the framework, obviously probably analyzing the need and then finding some activities. Um, does that sort of flow into other areas of the business around things like capability uplift, but also things around sort of maybe the, the mental health component that you mentioned? Uh, and is that is that something where you're sort of supplying them with an array of activities or an array of different learning opportunities that they can then take at their own pace? Is that sort of the philosophy behind that? 
A little bit, yeah. So we we create what is needed to be done. So with our mental health framework, we have a three-year strategy. We're in year three. Yep. Um, and the strategy is more around the mindset of what we're trying to do. Mm. Um, and then we would have a calendar of things that, that we are offering. And then we would, so for mental health and well-being in particular, we have um, our HR teams that are assisting to roll it out. So we would give it to them to roll it out in their business. Yep. And then we also have champions. So we call them um, ambassadors and they are upskilled as well in mental health and they have the keys to do it too so they're the ones out in the business there's 200 of them um, chatting away and, and and finding a need and then it will go up the necessary chain to get a, a manager's approval and off they go yeah so there are elements that everyone's doing together and there are elements that we can pick and choose from and we find that particularly useful um, and it actually um, it sees our data usage so we we partner with a company called Groove they have an app so we can see data usage going up. Yeah, great. That's fantastic. And do you apply the same sort of methodology to capabilities? Are you using sort of a capability framework-based approach or are you yes. sort of going down a different road with that? Yes. Um, so we have a really um, strong focus at the moment on succession. Yep. So growing our, um, our future leaders from within. So we actually have a clear capability framework. And um, we also have clear success profiles as well. So, and it's competency based. So we know um, that if you want to be head of sales in a particular business, these are the competencies you need and plus some extra criteria that you need. Um, and if you've been identified as a successor, we ask some qualifying questions like, A, do you want to be the head of sales? Yep. <laughs> this is a question we often don't ask. Um, and then we'll actually form a tailored development plan based on the capability of oh, the competency, sorry, that I'm missing. Yep. So they can build them because, you know, you see in a lot of places where people are on succession plans as a future leader and then the, the role becomes vacant and they apply, but they don't have this particular experience. Yeah. Well, we never gave it to them in the first place. So they've been there for ages and they've done nothing specifically in order to gain that. So what are we doing? Are we moving them in the business for a short period of time? Are we upskilling them? Are we pairing them with an internal mentor? What are we doing to help them close that gap so that if an opportunity does arise, they are ready? So that's where we're particularly focused on um, um, our capability framework to know what we need. So there's a bit of two things there, right? There's developing and retaining our people, but there's also, this is good for business. Yeah. Um, and it's really important, particularly the candidate market at the moment, there aren't a lot of candidates around and people are being headhunted all over the place. Mm. Why would our people stay with us? Yeah, absolutely. So that's where L&D plays a massive role. And it it doesn't always mean, oh, Johnny's great. Let's put him on a course. That's just yeah. not what it means. In fact, if, if anyone comes in, I want to do a, some kind of leadership course, we'll say, we'll stop you there. What specifically do you want to know? Because it might not be a course. It might be a couple of things that you want to take you in that direction. So development planning is really important. And to be honest, something we really need to work better on because that is the key. Like Development plans should be really bespoke. They should be individual. And it might be that you actually just need a coach or you need a mentor or you need to do this little skill set piece on financials or P&L management as opposed to generic leadership program over here, which yeah. is going to take six working days out of your time and it's not going to make you a better future successor anyway yeah it comes back to having impactful training right like we, mm -hmm. we actually want this to be impactful for you how do you manage the uh like the benchmarking of those capabilities so how would you sort of i guess go about sort of saying okay there's there's a couple of, of gaps here and 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 we've established those and we're going to try and you know plug those so that you're ready for succession um how do you define those? How do you understand what those are? Uh, so when we built our success profiles in the first place, we built them in conjunction with the business. So yeah. um, we have our capability framework, which has been built in quite detailed in terms of positive and um, less positive behaviors that go with each of these capabilities at different levels. So we have a lot of layers in our business. So mm -hmm. I'm talking mostly about the senior layer. Yeah. We have different strategies for further down further down is just retention and general development yeah. um, but further up is really capability based mm -hmm. and then we are testing them with people currently in those roles so let's take head of sales we have a head of sales in every business so we actually have five on tap ready to go yep. to talk to us about what makes a great head of sales and then mm -hmm. we'd talk to the head of the business as well and get their take as well and everyone is testing 
that success profile. And then we even have, once we've kind of narrowed down which is which and what we need, and we have it signed off by our chief executive, we actually have a few extra bits that might be business unit specific. So, you know, we have IPLEX. So we, we look at pipes and versus um, roller doors versus, you know, bathrooms. Um, there might be some business unit specific things you'd need in order to be the next head of sales. But um, for the most part, it's checked by the businesses and their testings. But yes, if somebody had those things and yes, they might not be able to get all of them, but if they had most of those things, we would take them. Yeah, yeah, that would make a good enough foundation for them to come yeah. across. Um, <clears throat> I have a bit of a random one uh, for mm -hmm. you that, that I'm super curious about because, because of your background in psychology. Uh, it, it seems that when businesses uh, survey or they ask people, they, they always want more training, right? Um, however... Yeah. There seems to be not a necessary, uh, not no no correlation between more training and higher engagement with with the training. Uh, why, why do you think that is? Why do you think people always they always want to learn more, but they don't always consume the training more? Do you, have you seen that sort of phenomenon occur? And and what have you done to address it? Because it's a bit of a, yeah. a weird one, right? It's a really good call out, actually. Yeah, it's completely true. Um, yeah. I think. From a mindset perspective, it's just a nice gift, you know. Oh, we just need more of this. We need more of this. Mm. Um, and then when it, the rubber hits the road, I don't have time. Yeah. So I think, you know, we do. Again, we need more training. Can sometimes be a throwaway co uh, comment. Maybe it's actually they're asking for something else. Yeah. Maybe they just need more support or more help with prioritization and things like that. Um, or maybe when they're getting the learning, they're like, oh, I didn't mean it like this. Yeah. Um, so some things that we find quite tough is when we have someone on doing a particular piece of learning, um, mm. it's really important that their manager is briefed and on board and allows them to almost give some permission to learn. Mm -hmm. So they've got the time to do that because that can be really tough because if the manager's not quite across it or things like that, they can say, well, that's great, but I actually really need you here. Yeah. Um, and that can happen a lot where you've got that conflict around things. So um, it's easy to say I need more training, right? It's yes. easy, but what does that look like? And 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 what is the learning? And it, it's funny because we did a lot of work with our non-wired um, teams around what they would want to learn. And they mm -hmm. all went, oh, we don't want to learn stuff. We want to do our shift and go home. Yeah. But then, you know, no thanks. Um, but actually on observing them, we realized they were teaching each other little skills often and they called them hacks. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And so all we needed to do was record the hacks and it was peer teaching and peer learning. And I think one of the big things that I'd call out there, because you raise an excellent point is what people actually think learning is. Yeah. And, and learning, if you take um, David Rock's viewpoint learning is just that moment where the synapses connect and you go fire and you go oh that's yeah. it that's learning so does it need to be a module maybe not does it need to be hey have you thought about doing it this way mm -hmm. oh cool thanks that's learning you know and the way that you learn should be should be really open to what that is because once we we realize that we're like you guys have a learning culture yeah. You're fluid. You, you who don't want learning, who don't need learning, are doing it and doing it beautifully. It was just we needed to give it that name. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we when we first moved into the learning and the flow of work piece and, and that micro learning, um, one of our senior leaders was over from New Zealand and he said to me, I said, how was your weekend or something? He goes, oh, I changed the light bulb in the roof of my car. And he said, it's really hard to do because it's a German car. <laughs> yeah. And I said, oh, well, how did you do it? And he goes, well, I looked at the manual and it was a thousand pages long. So I threw that on the floor and I looked up a YouTube clip that was in German, but in seven minute YouTube clip, I learned how to change the light bulb in my car. And I yeah. was like, that, that's learning. Yeah, absolutely. He chose to t spend seven minutes doing it in another language and it was still more helpful to him than the thousand page manual that was on the floor of the car. And that's yeah. how we should be learning. If it's worth being there for a day, of course, but we need to test whether it really is and what format it needs to be in. Mm -hmm. And people get very, you know, nervous about the virtual learning space and want to get back to face-to-face -to -face as soon as possible. And yes, there's definite merit in face-to-face, -face, but we need to think about what we're doing and why and, and what works best. You know, when we talk about learning, there's really only three things you need to do. It's just introduce a concept, allow them to experience it, and then allow them to reflect on it socially, 
talk about it and reflect on it or write it down or whatever it is. And that experience piece is either watching a video, watching it live, experiencing it themselves, whatever it is, so that they get that aha. And then they need to talk about what it is. And it doesn't matter what format that comes in. Like the hack that these guys were doing on night shift without even knowing it versus our, you know, four hour half day workshop on inclusive leadership. It, it's just, it doesn't matter so long as those three things are occurring. It can be anything. And we need to be open to them doing that because they're more likely to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, YouTube is generally regarded as the number one learning tool, right? Yeah. Like, like even my my mom, I I, uh, I, I bought her a vacuum uh, for, for for Christmas. She really wanted this nice Dyson and it, it, something happened. It got all caught up and I was like, oh yeah. no, I'll take it to the shop. She's like, no, no, I've watched a YouTube video on it. And I, I've taken the whole thing apart and I found the problem. It's a common problem and I've put it back together. You know, it's just something yeah. that is, wasn't a, a thing that was available um, until sort of recently, right? Uh, the the hacks I think lend really well to that style too, right? Where it's something where, hey, if we can capture this and we can record it, and I think it comes back to impact. There's trust there because your coworkers done this, uh, and you can see the business, the impact on your day to day life. It's easier to maybe it's undo that bolt or change that light bulb in the car or whatever it might be. Um, how, how do you go around about prioritizing the activities you do based on the business impact? Is that something that you, you sort of look into quite a lot? Yeah, I think we have, um, to make it easy, uh, we have pillars and key strategy items. And yep. where we're agile is we're agile within those. Yeah. So we know they're coming. In terms of priority, uh, priority strategy is king. So is it going to turn the dial on the business? Mm -hmm. Is this going to increase retention because people are thriving? Or if we put them on way too many programs, they're actually burnt out now because they can't cope because they're trying to do their job. Yeah. So we will prioritize based on that. Will it turn the dial on the business? Will it support our people more? So we will prioritize things that are giving us good results as well. Like we piloted a mentoring program where we mentor across businesses. We didn't know how it was going to go. Yeah. Um, we're in our third year of it and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we'd prioritize that. Yeah. Um, cost also matters. So if something is... Um, a lot more cost effective. We will prioritize that too. We actually have found the social learning part of things hugely valuable. So your expert is standing next to you. Why are we not getting that person to lead a hack as opposed to bringing a facilitator and why do we need to do that? Yeah. Um, you actually gain a lot more respect because, um, you know, we have a lot of people who work very hard in our business. And so sometimes if someone comes in externally, they're like, who are you? You don't know our business. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing here? Um, but actually we have someone else who's going to share something that they've learned or something that they've learned. We actually find that hugely valuable as well. And we'll prioritize that because it has so many positive side effects and increases cohesion, engagement, productivity, general happiness, which we know leads to a safer environment and a more productive environment. And so we would prioritize things like that. But again, if it's not going to turn the dial on business, we're probably not going to do it. Absolutely. I feel like uh, when you do bring those externals into the, the risk is that they don't know the business. So then they uh, sometimes feel like they need to overcompensate a little bit. It's the same as bringing in a senior leader. And mm. the way that they do that is through maybe industry knowledge or processes and systems, which aren't necessarily that impactful and aren't mm. necessarily a big problem, right? So mm. that having those uh, co-workers, I guess, talk about those core impactful things, I think is such a, such a mm. tremendous benefit to, to have. Yeah, and we do bring external people in, of course, but they they know our business really well. Yeah. You know, and I think it's around just that audience of it's not the teacher and the student. It is the let's chat. Yeah. Let's find out what's going on. Let's learn. Let's understand what we're doing here. And let's not be here for a minute longer than we have to. Yeah. it's Because we have work to do. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Mm. So it sounds like you've had a very varied, uh, varied sort of, career to date you've, you've, you've done a lot of things if you had to sum up sort of like one or two or three of your biggest lessons which is this is always a, a, an interesting question to ask because it's a tricky one like what what would you pass on to another HR practitioner maybe if someone was say coming into the industry or or coming across to sort of work with you and they wanted wanted a bit of advice I think uh, what would it be good relationships understand understand where they're coming from. I mean, man, if you're one-on-one -on -one leading a team, if you're leading a function, if you're leading a strategy, 
understand your audience and what they need because you're more likely to succeed. People don't like things being done to them. They don't like change being done to them. They do if it was their idea and they were part of it. So I think it is spend the time getting to know people, getting to understand and also identify if you're not that right person. So if you've been trying to really build a relationship with a stakeholder and they're just not seeing what's valuable and you're not kind of getting that traction that you need, well, who do they listen to? Go talk to that person, get that person to get in their ear and get that across the line. And I think that um, when you're building those relationships, you'll just be so successful if you just get in and listen and hear. My first three months of working here, I just went to branch um, in jeans and sneakers and listened, watched what was going on, met everyone, understood, made friends with people so that I could hear what was important to them. And then when you deliver what is important to them, they're like, see, they care, they heard. So I think that, and then also just be brave. Like we're not paramedics. Yeah. This is, it's okay. This is not, the urgency isn't there for us. We can actually, we have the luxury of giving something to try, making it a pilot, You've built good relationships so if you fail and we have, oh, that was terrible. Okay, move on. Next, what are we going to change? How are we going to pick ourselves up? What does the data say? So I think that I did prior to hearing those people speak at that conference, I would definitely perfect something and wait till it was perfect before mm. I rolled it out. And now just give it a shot. Absolutely. It's fine. And, and you've got good relationships. So they know that's what you're doing. Yeah, you know, and if it fails, it was just a pilot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't go well. Yeah, I it's think okay. <laughs> they don't need to be that scared of failing, right? Like it's it it it's something. Fail fast and fail often is is sort of a, a bit of a motto. Um, I actually heard something really interesting when I was listening to uh, some people at Atlassian talk, and there, one of the things that they said was they were asked about digital transformation. They were like, "We don't transform because we just constantly are trying to innovate." Um, and it sort of made me realize, like, "Oh yeah, you're constantly innovating, which means you have to fail." And that's what they said. They said, "We fail. We stuff stuff up all the time. Happens all the time, you know." But it's okay, which then means we never need to transform. Um, so I, yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, it's funny. I was actually, my kids are really into this show about um, science and the brain and things like that. And they were talking about creativity. And they said creativity is two things. Enth- oh, not creativity, sorry, innovation is two yep. things. It is enthusiasm and experimentation. And I was like, yeah. that's exactly what it is. So Just simple. be enthusiastic and try a lot of things and go, I wonder if. And if it works, keep going. And if it doesn't, pivot. And I think with L&D, while you've got big, firm pillars and big, firm deliverables, there's a lot of movement yeah. um, within those. And, and people won't mind if you're like, you know what, this is not having the impact we needed. Let's let's go look back. What do you guys think? How would you like it to be? We mm-hmm. just launched a, our frontline um, safety program. And it is designed because the business told us it's what they wanted. They said, toolboxes, please. They said, no BS. And they said, be authentic. And so we did. And and so when we present it and we roll it out, they're like, we we helped with that. Absolutely. That's amazing. And if if people do want to find a little bit more out about you or maybe join one of your wonderful talent programs that it sounds like you've got, Mm -hmm. where where should they reach out? Where can they they have a look? Um, I'll be on LinkedIn. Um, We put a lot of the stuff that we do on LinkedIn as well and Fletcher Building Australia as well. Um, Check us out. All the broader Fletcher Building too um it's quite a big business in New Zealand in Australia you probably would know us more by our businesses which are Laminex, Fletcher Insulation, Oliveri, Iplex, Stramit and Tradelink so those brands are probably a lot more commonly known um, than Fletcher Building Australia in Australia but yeah you'll find us there. Yeah that's amazing well thank you so much for for coming on having a chat Uh, it 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 was really awesome I really enjoyed it. No worries thanks for having me Blake. I'm Blake Probitz, and you're watching the Strategic L&D Podcast. If you want to stay up to date with our latest releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you just want the audio, you'll find us on most common podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you again soon.